Thanks, Pastor Ben. And thanks, team. Can we give these guys a round of applause as well? They do all the things that I cannot do. I don't know about you, but I have no musical ability at all in me. I can, whatsoever. Music and art are not gifts that God has bestowed upon me. So whenever I see these guys here strumming away, in all their glory, it, uh, it just inspires me so, so much. They do an incredible job. Well, we are continuing our series tonight. I'm going to wait until Ethan brings out my illustration. Uh, just because I know this would, this would otherwise distract you if I didn't wait. Uh, this is Pinocchio. I own him. Just in case you were mortified or you thought you borrowed it. No, I went on Facebook Marketplace. You can find anything on Facebook Marketplace, literally anything. Like who needs the black market when you have Facebook Marketplace? Not that I've used it for that reason, but I'm sure you could. I mean, if you can find a wooden Pinocchio in less than 25 minutes, you could find anything. Don't try that theory out. We are continuing our, th- our, our sermon series on the night times called Tough Texts of the Bible. And this is an interesting theme because who knows that if you've been saved for a while, there have been scriptures in your Bible where you've read that passage and thought, I have no idea what that means. Next passage. And we can often live our Christian life skipping through much of the Bible, or at least a few chunks of the Bible, simply because we don't understand it. If this is your first time to church tonight, maybe a friend brought you this night, it will be extremely interesting for you. And can I say this, is that there's some passages in the Bible that, as Christians that we believe and we read that are odd and that are confusing. And as Christians, it's sometimes that case that we wrestle with that that makes it okay. I was, I remember I was chatting with a student a number of years ago, and he had some doubts, and he was wrestling with a few things in his faith. And he came and saw me and said, man, I'm really worried about my faith because I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with certain things. And he equated wrestling with ideas and wrestling with, with topics and wrestling with things in the Scriptures as something negative and something detrimental to his faith. And I said, hang on a sec. The wrestle often produces understanding and the wrestle often produces something of worth and the wrestle often produces when you read a passage of scripture, when you read something you think, I don't necessarily understand it. What does that even mean? And when you wrestle with it, it's when your faith starts to come to life. I was watching a movie recently and there was a married couple that were arguing. They weren't fighting, they were arguing over a certain point of view and there was a couple next to them who were split up. And as this married couple arguing, the, the other, the, the separated wife turned to her divorced husband and said, if we argued like that, we would still be married. And I looked at that and I thought, interesting point that oftentimes as Christians and, and as people of faith, we, we rest with things, we argue with passages of scripture to make our faith whole. And this passage here is, a, is an interesting one. You may have read it, you may have not read it before, you may think, what on earth are we chatting about tonight? But can I encourage you, there's still a few things that God can teach us in this passage of Scripture. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes uh, that all Scripture is God-breathed, that all Scripture is useful, that even though passages can seem obsolete or passages can seem just totally left of field, that we can still gain something out of them tonight. And so we're going to read a passage here from Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, uh, it's after the creation story. We just did a theme uh, called Seven Sermons About God that Pastor Ben did that talked over the topic of creation. And, and this follows on from that, but the, the story goes slightly, if not extremely, pear-shaped. Genesis chapter 6, verse 6. We're going to start it there. It'll be on the screen, or you can refer this in your Bible as well. Uh, also, I believe all the kids are in kids' church, but if you haven't had the birds and the bees talk with your kids, this does briefly involve that in a negative way. Some of you got excited, but it's not good. Verse 6, Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and the daughters were born to them. And the sons of God saw the beautiful women and took as they, any as they wanted to be their wives. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not be put on my spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days, and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For whomever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves, key passage is sons of God, came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan who also came among them. If you just thought, what on earth, you are correct. In this passage of scripture, Genesis talks about it's the very, very beginning of the human story. God has done 
creation. He's built something that is great. He's built something that is perfect. He's built something that he constantly says time and time again in the creation story. It is good. And then in Genesis 6, it says that the sons of God came, had intercourse with women because they saw they were attractive, had children by them, and those children were the great men. They were, it says here, the great men of renown. They were heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. It gets more interesting when the term sons of God, and there's a few different theological points of view on this topic, and you can search this if you would like to later on in your spare time and go down a million different rabbit warrens and uh, conspiracy theories if you would like to. But most theologians would say that the term sons of God, it, it really refers to demons or to fallen spiritual angels. Job 1.6 I mentioned before because it says the sons of God came with Satan to say, hey God, can we start to tempt Job? And so goes on the story of Job where God says, okay, but these are your limits. And see, this passage of Scripture that says, well, there was daughters and fallen angels or, or, or demons. Moses refers to them as demons first off in Deuteronomy. Saw that the ladies were attractive, came and started having children with them. And these children were somewhat divine, but also not divine. Now, we see this in, in popular culture, don't we, with our superheroes. Half God or half divine and also half more to our first one up here, uh, if you uh, love Wonder Woman. We've seen Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman is obviously half something, half God or aware of the divine being, and also half human. The next one we see in pop culture, uh, if you were a kid of the 90s uh, who grew up with this as your constant babysitter, uh, Hercules on the Disney Channel was incredible. The old one uh, is always much better. We have Hercules, again, uh, son of Zeus, but also had a, a mortal mother. Uh, and the next one, my personal favourite, uh, if you haven't seen Guardians of the Galaxy, spoiler alert, uh, Star-Lord also has divine heritage. And this passage of Scripture sort of goes on this light, and we think, well, isn't that just a, a fairy tale? Isn't that just something that people create in, in, in way back in the day in terms of mythology? But ancients believed that once upon a time, and the Bible says that something similar happened. There's this story, and I'm going to get a little bit history geek here for, with you for a moment. There's a statue up on the screen, and the oldest story that archaeologists have ever found is called the Epic of Gilgamesh. You can search this up online, and this is a statue of Gilgamesh. Yes, he was holding a lion under his armpit. So he was a massive man, and the Epic of Gilgamesh talks about a man called Gilgamesh who did greaty and might, mighty Things and he started up a uh, 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 civiliz civilization in Mesopotamia, and he was half divine and half man, and because of that, he did incredible things. And this was founded, and it was dated to 2100 BC, 4,000 years ago, the oldest story that humankind has ever picked up. And this was the story that ancients believed. And you have this passage here that talks similar and says, "Well, after creation, something happened, and it wasn't good." that God created a world that was good and was pure. And whatever theological perspective or however you interpret, especially the part that says sons of God, if it was fallen spiritual angels or, or if it was just people that were fallen and in rebellion to God, however you take it, that the main point is this, that something came into God's creation and turned it. Because you have Genesis 1 comes in and 2 comes in, and the, and the creation story is incredible, and then evil comes in. In Genesis 6, the whole story goes south. And it ends up finishing with Noah. The evil penetrates to such a great extent that God, and we'll get to it in a minute, God says this has gone too far, that it is almost irredeemable. And thank the Lord for Noah. And it says that Noah came and, and Noah was one who was righteous and Noah was one that served God. But it was as if that the rest of civilization was somewhat controlled or influenced or having their strings pulled by the evil that literally stood behind it. Have you ever heard the term someone pulling the strings? Someone behind the scenes pulling the strings and they're unseen and oftentimes you don't realize that they're there, but, but they are, they're there behind pulling the strings and and making things happen or not happen. If you're a movie buff, we see this in the movie all the time. If you've seen Captain America, The Winter Soldier. Who's a Captain America fan? Anybody here? And in Winter Soldier, we see Hydra. And Hydra is obviously the, 
the bad fellas and the bad guys, but there's a guy there played by Robert Redford who's the, the, the main guy in the World Security Council. You know this is serious when you have titles like that as your job, the World Security Council. And Hydra, the bad people, if you haven't seen the movie, you should go and see it. And Hydra is there doing all the bad things and it turns out the end, Samuel L. Jackson, because who knows that every cool movie has Samuel L. Jackson in it. He must be like 70 by now, but I don't know how he keeps doing it. He comes in and it turns out the main, one of the good guys is actually the bad guy. And all these bad things that have been happening has just been this guy behind the scenes pulling the strings and causing issues to happen. Uh, we see if you've seen 007 Spectre, there's a scene there where, where James Bond is there and his brother is the evil guy. I mean, does it get any more crazy than this? And his brother is there and, and he turns to, to James Bond and he says, all the stuff, all the pain that you've gone through, it was me. ba 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 And then there's the car chase and the movie gets incredible. My favourite, however, scene with this in terms of someone behind the scenes pulling the strings is, of course, the greatest Disney movie of all time, which is The Lion King. Now, if you were born in the 90s, The Lion King is your childhood to a great extent. I have not seen the new Lion King yet, mainly because I'm scared. I'm like the Star Wars nerd afraid to go and see the new Star Wars movies because you're afraid that the new ones will be worse than the original. Because the original is perfection. But who knows, in The Lion King, it starts out with Simba in the gorge. And Scar, his uncle, is there. And Scar is walking along with Simba down the gorge and chatting with him. And then... It's that it, the movie goes and, and Scar is on top of a rock and the hyenas are out with the wildebeest. And it says, don't, don't start the stampede yet because we're waiting for Scar to give the signal. Hang on a sec, I thought Scar was good. And Scar gives the symbol and the wildebeest start running and Simba is in the middle of the gorge. And so Scar runs to Mufasa. He says, Mufasa, the wildebeest are running again. Which Mufasa replies, great, the wildebeest, they're meant to do that. And then he says the famous line, Simba is in there. He's in a situation that he has just caused, but now he's trying to play the good guy. And so the story goes that he orchestrates the death of Mufasa and Simba goes off to be with Simone and Pumbaa. Happy for the rest of their days. No worries. And he goes off and there's a whole life which Scar has been behind the scenes and being the string master with the puppet until Simba realizes that that's what Scar has been doing. And he goes and fights it. This passage of Scripture, we see a world that's gone wrong because evil has had its way. We see a world that has gone wrong because evil has so infiltrated humanity and people have allowed themselves almost to be under that spiritual covering that's not good, that unbeknownst to them, they've been that puppet with the string master that isn't for their benefit. And Noah comes in the story, and Noah is singled out here as the only righteous man left. He talks about men of renown, men who were great warriors, men who were warriors of ancient times, but they weren't good, which brings the point that power isn't necessarily good, that the good things that we seem as good can often be just ways that the enemy is trying to use as a puppet on the string. And Genesis 6 comes in and regardless of its complexity and what does that mean, we just see something that went so far south so very, very quickly that we have to see the spiritual implications from it. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. That is crazy. Have you read this passage before? This is a passage just before the flood comes in where God has made the world and he says everything they've thought or imagined, they don't even have any good thoughts. Like, husbands never even thought to buy their wives flowers. Like people didn't even think to do anything because it wasn't even a, a flickering thought of, oh, I should do something nice, but I won't. The thought wasn't even there. It says that whatever they thought, whatever they imagined was consistently and totally evil. I mean, usually even the bad people have some sort of conscience. I mean, even the worst of the worst have a line that, they, that even they won't cross. And it says here that that line just simply wasn't there because the enemy or evil or Satan had so infiltrated the thing that God had made. 
In verse 6, so the Lord was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. Wow. And it broke his heart. God says repeatedly, it's good, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. But the devil has so created a civilization where he's the puppet master and they're acting out evil that God says it broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race that I've created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people and large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground and even the birds of the sky. I'm sorry that I ever made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. You can see the extent here that the biblical writers of Genesis are trying to get across that God is so, so sorry that he ever made it. And it's because of what evil has done to his perfect and good creation. If you ever made something and then it broke, or made something even worse and somebody else came in and destroyed it. A couple of years ago, uh, I had the opportunity to run a Lego club at school. For some reason, in some way, shape, or form, in part of my chaplain's role, Pimpama, someone above me put me on the roster to do a primary group, which was Lego. Now, I don't mind getting paid for an hour to play Lego with small children. That's perfectly fine with me. Of course, I have nothing else to do that uh, you could possibly take up my time. But the most interesting part of Lego was that when other, when, it's okay, the roster guy isn't here, <laughs> is when people would make Lego, and if you had children, you would have seen this yourself, they would make a Lego statue, and then somebody else would get their look in, in their eye. And it was usually like a grade two boy. And the other person was usually a girl who was more creative than them and, and better at Lego than them. And the boy would look, and this would happen often, and they would turn, and they would look back, and they would turn, and they would get their arm and go, whack, and destroy the little girl's Lego person. And she would be so distraught. He broke my Lego. He broke it. Break your own Lego. Because she'd made it and someone else had come in and broken. Have you ever tried to build something or build a relationship or build a career or build something of worth or something of value in your life and then something else has come along and destroyed it and you almost couldn't stop it from breaking? We get this image here in Genesis where God has built something great but that evil has come into his creation and twisted it and destroyed it and the very thing he loves turns South. He says, but Noah found favor with the Lord. It's interesting here that Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 says that the first command that God gives to humankind is to go forth, to multiply, although married people said amen, and to be fruitful. Later on, the multiplication turned out for a negative effect. Then Genesis 1 multiplying was good because they did it in God's way. They multiplied because they walked with their Lord. But now they're multiplying, but it has a negative effect because there's something in the background causing them to act in a way they weren't meant to before. Genesis 6, it says, the people began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them and it had detrimental effect. There's a few things here we can learn from this passage of Scripture in all its seemingly absurd nature. The first thing we can learn is don't become a puppet to the wrong master. That something good in God's creation is now used in the wrong way. That we don't become a puppet to the wrong master, but instead we realize what God has in store for us instead. Genesis 6 verse 8, it says, But Noah found favor with the Lord. Continues on in verse 9, This is the account of Noah and his family. You've got to imagine here, everybody else has walked so far away from their moral compass, and only Noah is left. Imagine this in your workplace. You're the only one that ever tells the truth. You're the only one that does the right thing. You're the only one that does even a thought of purity. And this is Noah. It says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at that time. Noah was a good man. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Everyone else is being influenced by, with evil. And then there's Noah. So either Noah was extremely strong-willed or had the moral compass of a saint, or he had something different. He had something different that the rest of the world didn't seem to have or didn't want to have at that period of time. But it says here, verse 9, and he walked in close fellowship with God. And Noah walked in close fellowship with God, that when everyone else was known to them simply at the hand of a puppet master and evil was controlling and manipulating them, getting to do issues and things that they didn't, shouldn't, shouldn't have been doing, Noah was one that instead of 
allowing himself to come under that, chose to walk to the sound of a different drum and chose to walk differently and chose to believe differently about the life that he was meant to live. We see this in the New Testament. Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of this unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Paul writes even the New Testament, way, way, way past this, and reminds believers, reminds Christians, reminds this world that we have an enemy, and if you may not see it, but he's still there trying to pull the strings in our relationships. I was at the church this morning, and there was a, a family there, and weeks gone by, both him and his spouse had been at church and knew they were going through some sort of difficulties, and she hadn't been there for a while, and he comes up to me at the end of church this morning and says, before I walked out the door, my wife came to me and said, I want to separate, and that this is over. I know we've got two kids, but I'm out, I'm done. And he said, I was walking out the church at the time, and he's like, do I want to, do you want to stay here? And we can talk. He's like, no, you go, you're out. And he's there, and he's like, I've been praying, I've been believing, and I've been, but it just seems like there's a veil across her face. It seems like there's a veil. It seems like whatever I say, whatever I do, there's just something that's not going in. It's almost like there's just something else there manipulating the situation. Even when I say I love you, it doesn't get across. Even when I try and do something nice, it's as if it's not received. Even whatever I do, it's as if there's something else there trying to get in her head of this has happened and that has happened and that won't happen and just simply trying to play in the puppet. I'm sure you've seen this in your own life in terms of relationships or deeds or things that work where there's something behind there and say, Lord, I know it's not you, but I know it's not them. Is there something else here that I need to pray against? And Paul writes this in Ephesians, that our fight isn't against people, but against the principalities and the powers and darkness that we have a spiritual battle. And as Christians, we need to be simply aware of it. The first thing we learn is don't become a puppet to the wrong master. It says, in those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and the famous warriors of ancient times. The part of the Christian worldview is that evil is present and needs to be known. That there was evil that came, and evil that had its effect, but it seems as if an entire civilization became unaware of the root of their issues. That yes, they were sinning, that yes, they were doing the wrong thing, but the Bible clearly says there was something else behind it. The second thing we can learn from this passage of Scripture is simply to be aware. That everyone else was captive to evil, their strings were being almost pulled by evil itself, but it says Noah found favor with the Lord. Noah was simply aware. Noah, I mean, you have the human race, and then somehow Noah is singled out. I mean, Noah was still born in a normal way. Noah wasn't d divine. He, he was just a man, Noah. Maybe he looks like Russell Crowe. If you've seen the movie, I wouldn't get your theology from it. But he was just Noah. But it says Noah walked with the Lord, which means that he was aware that he could walk with the Lord, that he was aware that that was possible to not be played by the spiritual powers of evil, but he, that he, he had the opportunity to walk with the Lord and to walk differently. But he almost must have been aware that actually what's going on over here isn't good. And he must have had some awareness that it was wrong and it was bad and it's not the way that he or his family should go. There's this brilliant book uh, that it's a personal favorite of mine called The Screwtape Letters and written by a man called C.S. Lewis, who also wrote Narnia. And he writes the book from the perspective of almost the opposite perspective in which you would think. It's written, or it's written in, the, in the verse that it's a, a, a devil writing to his nephew and his nephew has a person here on earth which he is trying to get to not follow God. So his uncle, Screwtape, is writing to his nephew saying, if you want him to not follow God, make him do this and make him do that. And it's almost a, a battle plan for how to get this person to fall away from Christ. And in it, he has this incredible uh, conversation with his nephew. And it says, and it's in response to his nephew, saying, should I make myself known? Should I make myself the big fat boogie monster under his bed? Should I make him scared of the devil? 
and scared of spiritual things and scared of the battle? And should I make him really fear the devil? And this is the response of his uncle in the story as a, dem- as a devil. He says, I do not think you will have much difficulty in keeping the patient in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, simply suggest to him a picture of something in red tights with a pitchfork and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, he cannot believe in you. He's writing and says simply just keep your patient, keep the person in the dark, keep him absolutely unaware that you even exist, that you're simply just the puppet master trying to play his strings. The third, second point we can learn here is simply to be aware. So when we get into an argument or when we get into a pattern of life that isn't helpful, when we get into doing things or even in an argument with somebody else, that maybe you're not fighting against them, but maybe you're fighting against the thing that they've allowed themselves to be controlled by. Paul writes in Ephesians, we don't fight against flesh and blood enemies. He's writing to people that were literally being persecuted and murdered and martyred by the Roman Empire. And Paul says, just, just hang on a sec, because it's hard to love them if you've got an argument with them. But if you realize that your argument isn't necessarily against them, but it's against the evil behind them that they've allowed to influence, then you can start praying. So then Paul writes, and later on he says, because the weapons of our warfare are useful. Because if we were just fighting against people, then maybe I'd have to get the gun or I'd have to get the sword. But he says, because your foe is... Spiritual means you've got weapons at your side. We've got prayer. We've got fasting. That we can actually go into battle and fight against these spiritual powers. That we're not defenseless against what the enemy throws at us or our families. That we are to be aware. Third and last thing we can learn from this passage of Scripture is to know who you're walking with. It says, but Noah walked with the Lord. When everyone else was simply going along and being influenced by evil itself, that Noah walked with with the Lord. And it takes intentionality, doesn't it? Even in the midst of chaos. Can you imagine trying to be, we'll say Christian, but trying to follow God as Noah? I mean, it's not as if like, oh, my workplace is tough. But church on Sunday, praise the Lord for church. I just need to be around some Christians because my workmates are all crazy. I mean, Noah didn't have that. It's just Noah. Like he's a loner. It's just, no, he doesn't. Noah walked with the Lord pretty much by himself. I mean, he had his wife and his kids, but he's the one influencing them. And Noah had the intentionality that even when his world was in chaos, to walk with the Lord. He never walked with the Lord in the midst of chaos. I remember a number of years ago, I was uh, preparing uh, a message. I was preaching at chapel here for high school, and uh, we were living in Reedy Creek, just across the road here at the time. And I went for a walk. If you're like me, or this is at least true for me, if I pray at home, I'll fall asleep. That's just being honest. So I'll get up and I'll go for a walk. And I was trying to get a sermon in my head, and so I walked down the road up to observatory, and I would sit at observatory, and it was quite often, and simply just pray and get the message in my head and seek the Lord. And I went up there one night, just walking with the Lord. And I hear this helicopter above my head. And after living in Narang, I'm used to helicopters flying above my head because literally that happened on a daily basis, living in Narang on the edge of the state forest. But back then, it wasn't a common occurrence. And so there's this helicopter with a spotlight shining around the park that I'm sitting at up at the observatory, just, doing, just walking with the Lord. And the traffic continues like for five minutes and for 10 minutes. And then a police car rocks up. And two German shepherds get out of the car. And two policemen. And they started walking towards me, and I thought, this is as odd. Like, it's the observatory. I'm just walking with the Lord. And now chaos comes into my situation. These police officers come up to me. I'm sitting there minding my own business, walking with the Lord, being very spiritual. And they come up to me and, says, and say, what are you doing? Who are you? Why are you here? It's the middle of the night. Have you broken into homes in the observatory? To which I answered, so I'm a school chaplain, and I'm up here praying doing my sermon. (laughs) And you can picture the looks on their faces as a 20-year-old says this to two police officers with their German shepherds and their tasers. And they said, really? So you didn't go through any homes on your way here to pray and walk with the Lord. And funnily enough, next to me was a butter knife. 
on the table and they said, is that your butter knife? Have you used that tonight? And I'm thinking, what the heck can I do with a butter knife? <laughs> like even if I wanted to do something, it's a butter knife. What would I do with it? And so for the next 45 minutes, I was interrogated at observatory because apparently someone had been traipsing through backyards and observatory, breaking into homes. And because no one else was around, I was the subject. And then in my interrogation there at observatory, they said, look, we do believe that you did something. We believe that you did break into houses. We believe that you haven't been telling us the truth. But because we have no proof, we suggest that you walk home very quickly and without going into any more homes. But I just said, I'm, I'm out of here. Like, I'll walk home. I'm not going to argue. But I simply tried to follow the Lord and to walk with the God, but chaos just came in. If you're trying to walk with God, it seems like chaos is all around you. And you're almost the only one saying, but Noah found favor with the Lord. And everyone else is going cuckoo. And then there's me saying, so I'm just trying to walk with the Lord in chaos. And the third thing we can learn from here is simply to know who you're walking with in the midst of the chaos that often surrounds us. I'm sure Noah also looked around and thought, what the heck is going on? What on earth? But he simply chose to know who he was walking with. So the worship team can come up. The story of Pinocchio. You may have seen the movie. It was 1940s, so I won't single it out. The story of Pinocchio, you may have known it. Pinocchio is made out of wood. Pinocchio is there made out of wood and the owner goes to bed. And on going to bed, he makes a simple wish. And the story starts off with Jiminy Cricket saying, saying, if you wish upon a star. And the owner goes to sleep and he says, I wish that Pinocchio would be made into a real boy. We have the story, a star comes and Pinocchio bursts to life. And in the movie, Pinocchio is there. He's in a show and there's all these puppets, all of them with strings attached to them. There's boy puppets, there's girl puppets, there's big puppets, there's small puppets, there's puppets that are animals, there's puppets. For the entire show, there's puppets attached with strings being moved by men up, at, up the top. And the audience watches as puppets move and puppets go to the left and puppets go to the right and puppets jump up and jump down and jump sideways and puppets sing and puppets do what puppets do, and the children are applauding and entertaining everybody. And then Pinocchio jumps up. And Pinocchio used to have strings, but he became alive. Pinocchio jumps up there and he sings this song. I've got no strings to hold me down, to make me fret or make me frown. I had strings, but now I'm free. There are no strings on me. Hi, ho, the merry-o. That's the only way to go. I want the world to know. Nothing ever worries me. I've got no strings, so I have fun. I'm not tied to anyone. They've got strings, but you can see. There are no strings on me. Romans chapter 6, verse 17, we're going to land this thing here. Paul writes about the faith and the hope and the stringless life we have in Christ. He says, But thanks be to God that he, yet you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves to righteousness. Genesis 6 talks about a time in an era where everyone was simply a puppet on a string but Noah. And we say thank God for the cross. Thank God for what Jesus did. That we can also sing like Pinocchio did, I once had strings, but now I'm free. There are no strings on me. The devil often tries to attach the strings but we can say through faith and through Christ, there are no strings on me. And when the enemy comes and tries to cause us to go back to the puppeteer, we simply say, you have no hold on me. You have no hold on my actions. You have no hold on my faith. You have no hold on my family. You have no hold 
or on my arguments or, or, or simply put you having a hold on me because Noah walked with the Lord. Church, why don't we stand on our feet here? Maybe you're here and you've said, I once had strings, but now I'm free. Or maybe you're here and you simply say, you know, I, I, I've seen that spiritual fight in my life. I've seen that fight. I've, 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 I've sensed when evil has come in and tried to manipulate a situation or a circumstance. Maybe you're here and you've simply said, you know what, I, I reckon much of my life, I'm, I'm still giving my freedom over to the puppet master of old. I've allowed evil to come in and to influence me. I wonder if tonight you simply want to say, Jesus, would you come and would you cut those strings? I've been that slave to sin, but Lord, I want to be a slave to the good. I want to walk with you. I want to be set free. I want to be redeemed. Lord, I want your grace and your mercy and your, your life to come into me. With every eye closed and head bowed. I simply want to ask a simple question. If you say, you know what, my life isn't being directed by God. Jesus isn't the leader of my life and the forgiver of my sins, but I want him to be. If that's you in this place, would you simply raise your hand and say, Jesus, I want those strings cut off. Across this room, many of us have done it before. You're simply saying, Jesus, would you come? I've been that slave to sin. There's been that spiritual fight. Lord, I want that freedom. If that's you in this place, would you simply raise your hand? Come on. Yeah, I see that hand. That's unreal. One of our team, we're going to come and chat with you afterwards. Anybody else? Is anybody else? It's awesome, mate. You raise your hand. There's anybody else here? Come on. Well, church, you can open your eyes. We're going to finish with a song and afterwards we've got young adults hang out. Can I encourage you, maybe as we sing this last chorus, you're like, you know what? The enemy's tried to attach a few of those strings. Maybe it's an argument or it's in a fight or it's something in your life where you know that that spiritual enemy has come and tried to play you. In this last song, can I encourage you to simply give over to Christ and say, Jesus, I once had strings, but there are no strings on me. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Father. As the worship team starts to play, God, we thank you for your freedom. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord God. It says, but Noah found favour with you. I thank you we found favour with you, Lord God, through what Christ did for us on the cross. We're not saved by works, but by your grace. God, I pray that if there's anybody of us now, Lord God, that is simply maybe allowing ourselves to be played by the enemy, that, by the spiritual enemy that we have, Lord God. Thank you right now as we give it to you, we find freedom in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church, let's worship before we finish.